Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I am beginning uh, our third week of teaching on how to find God's will. And actually this is just going to be a part of a series that I'm going to do on how to find God's will, how to follow God's will, and how to fulfill God's will. And I am really excited about this. We've already done two weeks of teaching. We've covered a lot of the foundational things, and I encourage you, if you've missed any of this teaching, to please get the materials that we're offering because everything fits together, and uh, I'm building on things that I've said. Today what I want to do is to illustrate some of the things that I've been talking about. You know, uh, we have these sayings that a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, sometimes people get things through uh, testimonies, through seeing how this affects a person more than they do through just getting uh, teaching on it. And we have a series of testimonies. This is called our Destiny Stories, and there's actually seven people's testimonies about how God just plucked them out of just an average life everything, you know, nothing special going on in their life and drew them to our Bible college, how they discovered God's will for their life and now how that not only their life but the lives of other people are totally being transformed because these people found God's will. So we're going to play you a story about David and Russ and Judith Forgeston and how that they found God's will for their life and this will illustrate the things that we've been talking about. Since I was 16, I have been really looking for a relationship with God. I really first uh, sought God in the Jewish uh, religion since I was born Jewish. From that point, I uh, started uh, reading uh, books about uh, metaphysics. And uh, I really started getting very interested in Hindu mysticism. He was always uh, wanting to be in relationship with me, but a long time before I had pretty much written him off. It really started in high school. I was doing a lot of just drugs and drinking and being a pothead and I just didn't know what anything else was in life, what else to do. So I found my little niche and I got pretty good at it. I was just a big pothead and uh, that kind of opened up some doors for me to start selling some pot and all of a sudden I made some connections and before I knew it I had found myself driving across the country uh, buying duffel bags full of pot, dealing with tens of thousands of dollars and just living the crazy life that you can imagine that goes all along with it. I had gone to India. I wanted to find a guru. I spent time in some ashrams there. I saw some supernatural things uh, there also. For me, it was always, always needed more, oh, never satisfied. Like I was the guy at the party at the end of the night that would keep on saying, let's smoke another bowl, let's drink another beer, and let's keep on going. I came back from India and uh, I moved out of Hindu mysticism and started uh, getting interested in New Age uh, thinking. I never knew what I was doing. I was in like identity crisis. I was really still involved in worldly things. I was married, I had children, I was a chiropractor. I was really seeking God. Uh, but it was really many years later that uh, I, really, I really started to find the, the one true God. My dad had always talked about God. He was a real spiritual guy. He was into the mysticism and things like that. And, and I thought that was cool. And I, I thought for myself, one day, I'm gonna kind of follow that path and I'm gonna find out the truth. You know, I'm gonna travel around the world and see things like he did. And he, Cause he told me stories about going to Africa and India and all over. People were talking to me about, uh, about Jesus, but initially I was really not interested at all. But after many years, uh, I started to really feel like I ought to really check into Jesus. I met someone who became a dear friend, and uh, she was Christian, and, uh, 
She was such a loving person and such a generous person. She uh, gave me some of Andrew's tapes, uh, Andrew Womack's tapes, and I started listening to him, and it just started resonating. I would just hear the examples that he gave, and I just really believed that he was experiencing this, and I started to really feel I could experience God too, and I could have a relationship that he was talking about, and that really stirred me. One thing I remember in high school was I, uh, my car was in the shop, and I borrowed his car one day, and uh, me and my friends were driving around in it, and my friend found a Bible in the back seat of his car. And I was shocked, like, what is a Bible doing in my dad's car? So we, uh, when, when I got back home, I asked him about that. And I, I told him, you know, and I asked him about it. And he said, God is real and that Jesus is the Son of God. And I was just totally shocked. Like, how could he have done that? How could he have uh, sold out to some religion? In those time periods, I was just telling him about how my life had become transformed by, by God's love. He didn't get nervous anymore like he used to. And he, he used to have a lot of anxiety and things like that. And there, he just had peace. And there was a, something different about him. I couldn't put my finger on it. We would still have a lot of fellowship, but he would always, uh, we would meet for dinner or for lunch and he would quickly want to leave. I was always busy hanging out with my friends all the time, and you know, but I, I kind of felt bad for him, so sometimes I would, but I'd always be itching to get out. But after some time, it was like, I, would, I started opening up to him, and I started telling him about my life and the deal in drugs and the big you know, entrepreneur I was becoming, and, and he just sat there and he listened, and, and he, he was interested. He really, I could tell it, he really cared about me. He really started to spend more and more time with me. Instead of uh, going in 20 to 30 minutes, we started having lunches and dinners that would last for two and three and four hours. And uh, after some time, I started sharing more of the problems and, and he was just giving some wisdom. Good, you know, he, again, he wasn't preaching at me, but he, I could just tell that he knew stuff I didn't know. And he was just, seemed to be fascinated by what I was talking about. I believed him because it was my dad, you know? I knew my dad would never lie to me, even though I, I couldn't totally relate. Something was really happening. I could tell something was changing, and I remember going afterwards to party with my friends and telling these wild stories. That my dad's talking about seeing people's blind eyes getting opened and people getting healed, and we all just laughed hysterically, and it was all kind of fun. But to me, that something was happening, I, I could tell I was starting to think about it. I was starting to think about God. I was just sitting in my living room one day and uh, I received revelation. I knew that Jesus was Lord, that he was the Son of God, the Bible was the absolute truth. It just came, like I couldn't explain it. I just knew that I knew that I knew and I was so excited about it. The very first thing that I really realized that afternoon was that God had a plan for my life. When I went to sleep that night, I remember laying down and for the first time ever, just feeling safe. For the first time ever, I felt totally secure. Like I was just laying there, looking up, just thinking, God, thank you. I slept so good that night. Next morning I woke up, just got ready for school just like normal, get in the car with my roommate. We're headed to class. We had nine o'clock classes. And I reach into my pocket for my pack of cigarettes like I always do. And I just looked at him and, and threw him out the window. I don't think I'm gonna smoke a cigarette. I, I think I'm done with these. You know what, I think I'm done smoking pot and getting drunk. It was real, it was totally real. From that moment on, I never got drunk again. I never got stoned again. I was totally, I was totally set free. After that first class, it, it must have been by now about 11 o'clock. So I called my dad. He was at work at the office, and I told him, "Dad, I believe in Jesus." This is a, a kid that I had always loved. I had always had an emotional connection, but now I had a spiritual connection with him also. 
my dad came and he bought me a Bible and he gave me this Bible and then he gave me probably five or six tapes from Andrew Womack and I never heard of this guy or anything about it or didn't know any of that stuff. He just said, this will really help you. I just started listening to those tapes and Andrew was just, every word he said was just, yes, this is true. He left college. He moved away from the drugs and the alcohol that he had been involved with. He, he came back to live with me. I heard Andrew say that he used to read the Bible all day long, every day, that there was like a period of time, maybe when he was in the army or something, where he just sat and the book was in front of him day and night, day and night. And so I just thought, well, what am I doing? I need to, I need to do that too. I need to read the Bible. I need to find out what, what it says. I need to find out who God is. This is the key to everything. He just basically spent 10 hours a day in his room for several months just studying the Word of God. That's what I did for about six months. I just listened to those tapes probably three, two or three a day, and then I was reading the Bible the whole rest of the time. And I was just growing and learning and, and going on and on, and it was, it was really good. He wanted more of a relationship with God, and I said, Andrew Womack's Bible College, that's where you need to go. And it just made sense to me, like, of, of course I, I have to go there. I don't really know exactly when, because I'm sure that this is really good. I know I'm learning a lot. I'm getting the Word. I'm starting to learn the books of the Bible. I'm starting to see whole messages. It's all coming together, and, and I'm really growing in that. And one day I was just walking around the uh, lake where I went sometimes, just praying, stopping, reading the Bible a little bit, and it was just, so clear to me, go to Karis Bible College. And so he planned that right away, that he wanted to go there. So I just called my dad up and told him, I'm going, I'm going to Bible College in August. And he said, I want to go too. I remember something really amazing. It was around this time, I was talking with my dad and my dad said something that totally shocked me. He said that he, he can actually imagine retiring and he could actually imagine just quitting and, and doing whatever God told him to do. But I'm a chiropractor and I have all these responsibilities and I have all these patients and, and I really need to work for a few more years because I need to earn more money so that I'll have a secure retirement. It wasn't but a, a couple months after that that we were at a Gospel Truth Seminar. And of course, they're talking about Karis Bible College and what Karis Bible College meant to them. And I just knew as I heard their testimonies that I was going to Karis Bible College. I wound up giving my practice away and just blessing people with it. I mean, it was really something was working in me that was absolutely supernatural. Within a few months, he was at school and we were there together. I started that August and he, he got all that done by the November session. So we were in school together and it was just, again, we were living together. We were best friends and growing and learning more and more. There was a student, uh, one of our friends at CBC that we got to know um, just being around the class. We were talking about the word and I really liked this guy. He was, he was a bit older, he was in his 70s. But he comes to me one day saying that God really put it on his heart to go to India. And he was really excited about it. And in my mind this whole time I was just thinking, go unto all the world <laughs> and preach the gospel. And so I was just, well, I'll go. You know, I'll go with you. And he, just like that, he was like, great, well, let's go. He really didn't know why he was going. He really said, after, after some time as, as we established that I was going with him and everything, he really started to think, I, I think we might be going, I think this is about you. When I got back, of course, I had already thought me and my dad are in this together, and so, I know that we had talked about going to Africa already, and so I didn't really know how this was gonna, gonna go, but he picked me up from the airport, and we went that night to Waffle House. 
we're sitting there having uh, breakfast at nighttime, and and it was I was explaining to him this experience that I had, and I was telling him about it, and I was telling him, I really I think we need to go to India, and I it was really you know it was really strong. I was really sure, and and he was sitting there like, whoa, whoa. But what he told me was that during this trip while I was there, he told me that God had woken him up at like 4.30 a.m. in the morning. I heard this message which seemed like an audible voice. And it was, you went to India many years ago seeking the truth. You now know the truth. Go back and tell them. And from that point on, we knew we were going to India. After you start sowing the word in your heart and you start conceiving, after a while you build up momentum. And it's like you're going a thousand miles an hour. And you know what? You just can't make a U-turn when you're going a thousand miles an hour. Man, you have to slow down. It takes a long time to slow down and to apply the brakes and turn around. There are some of you that are moving so slowly that if a pebble got in your way, you wouldn't have enough momentum to get over it. The more I let go of, of my own plans and the way that I think things have to work out, the more God can position me in the right place. Well, it started with me moving in with a friend in Switzerland that has just uh, returned from Rema. And she, uh, so we moved in together and she gave me uh, some tapes because I had never heard of spirit-filled Christianity or anything. And so she gave me tapes from a conference and there were two tapes that stuck out and I just put them aside and I thought, I have to listen to that again. And those were the two tapes of Andrew. And so that was where I first heard his name. And on that tape, one of the tapes, uh, he gave the testimony of his son being raised from the dead. And actually, that's, I mean, that was very impressive to me because I hadn't heard stories like that. I hadn't been around spirit-filled Christians. Uh, so that was very impressive. But even more impressive to me was that at, in this tape, he talked about how when you're about total commitment, and he said, if you're going 1,000 miles an hour, you can't make a U-turn. And I realized that that was, my life was not going a thousand miles an hour because U-turns were still possible. And I realized when I listened to that one tape that I wanted to get to a place where my life was fast enough so that there was no turning around. And so I just quit my job and I uh, moved out to where I, where I lived and the visa came in time. And so I moved to Colorado Springs. <laughs> the school takes a mission trip in second year and they have various different places they go. They go to Mexico, they go to Russia, they go to England, and sometimes they go to Africa. I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to go to Uganda. And there were, there were only six spots available for this mission trip. And I remember David and I had a lot of conversations about this because we wanted to do ministry together. And we decided that we were going to be almost like a married couple, in a sense. Either we both were gonna to go to Uganda, or we, neither of us were gonna to go to Uganda. We put our request in just like everybody else, and sure enough, they picked us, and uh, we were just thrilled about it. So we ended up going there, which uh, along, along the way, one of the other team members from the school that went is a, a girl named Judith who ended up becoming my wife <laughs> after this. But it was really, that was also, I think, a totally divine appointment because on that trip is where me and her really connected and started to become really good friends on that trip, just talking about uh, everything, so. Yeah, that, that started another area of just thinking more about missions and also on that, uh, during that trip, I started talking forever to David <laughs> about all the different, uh, just different topics of life, but also about missions, because I knew at that time already that he was going to go to India. And it really, I mean, it amazed me. I remember one thing he said was that he was, 
you know, I, I said, what is the challenge? What's the biggest challenge for you when thinking of your going to India? And he said, there's no challenge. <laughs> and I remember in the beginning, I thought, y y that's not honest. You know, there are challenges. We knew that we were called. And so that was the main, that was the main drive. And I remember uh, talking with some people before and they had brought up, well, this possible challenge and that possible challenge and what are you going to do about this? And I honestly told him, I don't think about any of that. And he, he basically told me, if you, if you just know what God told you to do, then it's not a challenge, it, it's an adventure, but it's not hard and it doesn't have to be scary or anything like that. And I remember that was kind of the beginning of me starting to talk to him about you know, the difference between just trying to live a Christian life and, you know, trying to do the best you can and living in grace, which means you just, you just follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and you don't expect it to be hard. Me and Dad were going to India. It was absolute. And we talked about it again and again. We, we talked about different ideas, but really we, we didn't have a plan. We didn't know what we were going to do. We had this idea that we were going to have packs on our backs and Bibles in our hands and we were going to go preaching in the remote villages where the name of Christ has never been heard. I remember telling people at CBC that I could be dropped. I was so convinced that God was going to be faithful to direct us that we could be dropped from a helicopter anywhere on the subcontinent of India, and somehow God was going to direct us where we needed to go to do the ministry that He had planned for us in India. One of the things I remember right before we were leaving, we had a meeting with Andrew, and he said to us, you know, this really doesn't make any sense. He said, normally I would always tell someone not to do what you're doing. This is not it's wise, this isn't smart, all these things. He was saying this again and again, and we were just sitting there, okay, okay. And then he said, but I think it's right for you guys. I don't know why, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I think you guys are right and doing the right thing. Right after we graduated, David and Russ left for India, and I went back to Switzerland, and I uh, prepared our wedding. And then in August, David joined me in Switzerland. So he just came directly from the mission field uh, and came to Switzerland and we got married. And then we went on our honeymoon in Italy. And then right after the honeymoon, we went back to, to India. So, so we, we really were world travelers right from the start of our marriage. <laughs> Andrew's complete teaching titled, How to Find God's Will, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD for 16 pounds. This series is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 16 pounds when you write or call. Or you can get today's teaching as part of the God's Will package, which includes three albums, How to Find God's Will, how to follow God's will, and how to fulfill God's will. As a bonus, the package includes the Destiny Stories DVD, highlighting four stories of people whose lives were transformed as they pursued God's will for their lives. The entire package has a catalog value of 48 pounds, but Andrew considers this teaching so important, he'd like to get it to as many people as possible. Therefore, he's offering it to you for a gift of just 40 pounds or more. Remember to specify the CD or DVD package when you order. The fourth audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. 
But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fourth CD titled Renewing Your Mind Free of Charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled God Wants You Well for £8.50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. Karis Bible College in Colorado Springs is rich spiritual soil. 2007 graduates Russ, Judith, and David Ferguson have planted a new Bible college in Chennai, India with 60 first-year students. They've seen 350 pastors transformed through teaching Andrew Womack's Discipleship Evangelism course. In addition, they manage 162 small business loans, helping India's outcasts lift themselves from poverty. For a complete report on this story, go to awmi.net and click on today's news feature. We got a brother who got the hold of Andrew's materials in Riga, and he was a professional um, announcer on uh, radio. And uh, he decided he was going to start reading Andrew's books for 20 minutes a day, a special program on radio in uh, Latvia. And so in Latvian, he sits down every day and he's now on and th the third of Andrew's books. And he just reads it 20 minutes a day and people are contacting him. And he's now given up two days of his job a week to sit down and translate materials because he sees it as a means of helping to change his nation. And that's what it's about. You know, there is darkness out there, but praise God, the darkness has not overcome the light. And the light of this word that Andrew is bringing is going from nation to nation. Krakow, Poland, an ancient and beautiful city, famous as the early home of the man who became Pope John Paul II. He presided at the Vatican for 27 years as one of the most faithful and godly Catholic leaders of all time. And of course, Andrew had the opportunity to minister to the Polish people in a very unlikely setting. This is in a bar. There's about uh, five or six churches that have come together. They're expecting anywhere around 400 people to come together. It'll be my first time to minister here. And uh, we had one church that rented a bus and brought 50 people. We've already had one woman that I prayed for tonight who's had pain for five years and had uh, an autoimmune disease and just was in constant pain. And she was instantly healed, already standing up, walking around. So we've already seen great miracles before the service even starts. It's going to be great.